Awesome, guys. Good evening. Um, if you have the lesson with you, I usually send it out via email. If you don't, they can just forward that on to you. And if not, and you just want to follow along in your Bibles, we're going to be jumping from about Mark 6 to, I believe, it's going to be, um, let me look a little bit later down, uh, Matthew 14. So Mark 6 or Matthew 14, start off in Mark 6. Um, you know, as a church, most of us are actually about to head off to a our Austro-China, what is it called? Conference. Missions Conference? Yeah. Or is it just Conference? 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 Austro-China. Austro-China Conference? But that, yeah. that, 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 so that's where we're all going to be heading out to next week. So this lesson is kind of spurring on that. And uh, just one other little kind of side note before I forget. Um, I believe it's this Saturday. Monica is coming back, right? <laughs> Um, but I am saying not everyone is going. We only are having those that are picking her up, and that's it. We're not going to give her that little welcome there. Just because we're going to see her in like three days later at the conference. So she's only here just for a moment just to get to Sydney. But I don't know about you. Um, going to this conference, you can kind of feel after it's been a long year, just like, man, this is a needed break. This is kind of, I, I'm so excited to go and see my friends, so excited just to get out of Auckland for a little bit, get out of the city, and just have a little bit of fun with my family. You know, and you start asking yourself, well, when's the last time you had a real vacation? You know, when, what did you do on that vacation? What, how did it feel when you were getting, going on that break? And then the main thing is, how did you feel when you came back? That's a big part of it. I know I've had a lot of different little vacations or little days off or whatever, but I know the thing that whenever I think of a, a, an awesome break, I still always think about my honeymoon. I loved our honeymoon when Tegan and I got married. It was awesome. It was amazing. We went out and we did like snorkeling. We hugged some little koalas. We had like little kangaroos everywhere. It was awesome. We slept in. That was awesome. You know, you don't get that much in the ministry. Um, it, it, it was just great. And don't even get me started on my quiet times. Quiet times were awesome whenever you have a day off. Why? Because you wake up at like 9 o'clock. You just chill. You have some hot chocolate. Then you get to pray. And it, it was just good. Like there was no rush into it. You're just kind of like, God, hey, how are you hanging out? You know, on the couch. It was, it was awesome. And actually throughout the ministry, Jesus had these times as well. In Mark chapter 6, starting off in verse 45 through 46, it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into a boat. And go ahead of him into Bathsheba, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Yo, know, this is just after, I believe it was just this Sunday, I started preaching about um, Jesus feeding the 4,000 and the 5,000. So this is just after it just happened. I think the funny thing it says here is Jesus made them get in the boat. It didn't just say Jesus instructed them to. He's like, you guys get off in the boat. I'm going to dismiss the crowd. I need my own time. Mm -hmm. Even Jesus had to force the disciples out of his life. And I wonder, you know, you start wondering, why did they, when did they start calling these things retreats? Instead of like a day off or a time away, we now start calling them retreat. And we can kind of feel why though, right? You know, you feel like you're fighting this war in life. And now you're like, come on guys, retreat, run away from life. And you're like, I just need to get away. Mm -hmm. And even Jesus felt that a little bit. But there are two types of retreats though. There's one where you have a retreat, which means you're, you're, you're pulling back from the front lines to regroup, replan, and go and attack. Mm -hmm. Or those are retreats that you're just buying time for your next defeat. Those are two types of retreats that we can have in life. See, yes, Jesus needed this retreat, but this was not just a time to go and sunk back and like, oh, I need to lick my wounds, mm -hmm. but this was a time where he needed to properly mourn his cousin, uh, John the Baptist, who just died, but he was going there to regroup himself and go back into the ministry. Mm -hmm. See, anyone can have a good time on a retreat, on a, on a, uh, 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 a day off, on a vacation. That's not the point. The main thing is, how are you coming back? Mm -hmm. Are you coming back refreshed? Or are you coming back, man, I just wish we had another couple days. Mm -hmm. I wish I was in Sydney for a, a, a little bit longer. But no, we need to come back from these times just like, I'm refreshed, I'm ready, I'm focused, and I'm ready here to go. Yeah. So the real challenge when going on these days or these retreats and these times away is, yes, 
It's awesome to enjoy the vacation, but we need to learn how to enjoy the battle when we come back. Mm -hmm. So my title of my lesson is simply this, learning how to enjoy your spiritual life. Awesome. Point number one is learning to calm the storms. So after he did dismissed him, we read here and catch up on the story in verse 47. It says, later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. It's talking about Jesus. He saw his disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against him. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them. Okay, let's just stop there for a moment. Did, did you notice that? Jesus saw them struggling at night. But he didn't start walking on the lake until about dawn. Mm -hmm. Meaning he saw them struggling, but he's like, even though they're struggling, I still got my own time. Have you ever felt like God was just watching you suffer? Mm -hmm. Well, he did. This actually proves it. Jesus was like, yeah, I watched them suffer. That's all right. Continue reading. It says, walking on the lake, he was about to pass them by. Wait, hold up. Have you ever felt like God was just passing you by? Mm -hmm. That was his exact intention. Wow. He was like, hey, they're all struggling and everything, but I'm just going to walk on by. I'm going I'm to race them to almost the other side. Jesus had no motivation or no motive to actually get into their suffering. He wasn't there to help them at all. It says, but then when they saw him on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they saw him and were terrified. Immediately spoke out to them and said, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the winds died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves, um, excuse me, about their loaves, their hearts were hardened. It's funny, Jesus only stopped because they noticed him. He had no intention to actually go and interact with them. But just to kind of understand how we can probably feel, um, there's not really a table out here, but here, let's get... Chris and Pascal to do a little arm wrestling challenge right here. Oh, wow. So, Chris and Pascal. And, uh, yes, so, maybe you guys can just get on the ground. Sorry, I wish there was like a table or something. Time. But, um, Chris, Pascal, Chris, you can kind of lay down that way. Chris, uh, or Pascal, this, whatever your guys' names are anymore. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, try and do an arm wrestling right, challenge. Right on, oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, you gotta do right arm row. All right, for all this intents and purposes, we might know who will win. Come on, Kelly. Um, but all right, one, two, three, go. Come on, Pascal. Oh, oh really? Kelly, <laughs> <laughs> really? come on. What's going on? Yeah, you can, you can try, Chris. Oh, oh okay. All right. all right, Timoteo, come up here. Uh, you guys still stay down. Oh. Timoteo's now going to help Pascal. Oh. 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 <laughs> oh, all right. Go. All right, three, two, one, go. Oh. 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 Strength of ten men. Okay, right, that's good. That's good, guys. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if Pascal really noticed, but I told Tim Taylor not to really help me. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so, sometimes that's a little bit like life. Is we're like, oh, wow, God's coming. He's going to help us. It's going to be awesome. And then God just kind of walks on by. You're like, why didn't God help me at this time? Maybe sometimes we're shocked because God doesn't come and help us. And we almost start blaming him in our lives. God, you were supposed to come and help me. See, Jesus had no intention of helping them, mainly because he didn't really need their help. Excuse me, they didn't really need his help. Mm -hmm. How many of us are recently going through or have gone through an issue that you've already faced before? Mm -hmm. Meaning God has already answered your prayer before there. He's strengthened you before. Mm -hmm. You actually conquered it. And now you're waiting for God just to rescue when actually you have enough strength now. Wow. God cool. already put you through the test. God already made sure that your faith is strong enough to face it again. And now you're just like, God, rescue me. And you're just trying to like bob in the water and hopefully that he picks you up. Mm. See, have you ever wished that God would just kind of get your back, but instead that you're the one that's supposed to be facing the challenge? Mm. Sometimes we even kind of look back at our victories and we almost start facing challenges now. And we look back at a victory and we're like, dang it. 
I wish God didn't give me that victory. Now I, now I have no excuse. <laughs> I know that's kind of how I feel a little bit. I, I love my sister Esther in, back in Sydney. Um, but the way that I met her when I shared my faith with her, she was one of those girls that was out on the streets and she was kind of like um, advertising for certain little like um, charities. And so she would stop you on the middle of the street, give you a little brochure and everything. She stopped me. And that's kind of how I shared my faith with her. But now every single time I see someone doing a little charity brochure, <laughs> there's always something in the back of my heart is like, dang it, maybe I should stop. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that's another mm -hmm. Esther. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you guys have those things where, you know, maybe you shared your faith for six hours and the last person you shared your faith with, they're the ones that were your visitors or started studying mm -hmm. the Bible. Yeah. And now you have that on your back and you're like, dang it. Mm -hmm. That means I have to go for six hours. I wonder if Chi feels that way. That last person he shared his faith with Cain. Yeah. Right? I wonder, I know that the Clays kind of think this way as well. Every single time Joe talks about selling cupcakes, he always <laughs> refers to the, the Clays. You know, you can, you can raise a thousand dollars, the Clays did it. And they're like, dang it, I wish we never said it. <laughs> but yeah, we have those things. But what makes it worth it? Esther. Mm. She makes it worth it. Cain, he makes it worth it. Those thousand dollars, I'm pretty sure that that helped in the moment. Right? Looking at those victories, it's not just looking at it like, wow, I'm without excuse. That should inspire us. Like, of course I should share my faith with more of these people. Of course I should have that faith. And that's what God wants us to think. Is that once we face these battles and are able to overcome, those are now inspiration for us to face those again and again. Mm -hmm. See, this wasn't the first time the disciples here were facing a storm. Many of them were fishermen. So they had experience to rely on. And they were also in the boat when Jesus fell asleep on them. They knew that Jesus was going to be the one that was going to calm the storms all the time. But yet we still hear that same lesson that we talked about on Sunday. That their hearts were still hard at learning the lessons that Jesus was trying to show them. It said that they didn't understand about the miracle about Jesus feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000 because their hearts were hard. See, storms are always going to be a part of fishing, as well as fishing for men and as well as just life in general. See, there are some storms that we have the ability to face. It's just we simply don't want to go through it again. Yeah. We might have come on the other side that last time, but we had to go through a lot of struggles, straining at the roars to get there. And we're like, I don't really want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we might be able to run the extra mile, but we'd rather not. We could share our faith with that one extra person, but we stay silent. We could fight our sin and repent. We've done it before, but it's a little bit easier to just give in now. See, what makes most quitters is not impossibility, it's responsibility. Mm. Meaning, if you decide you want to be a winner, if you decide you want to live a righteous life, it comes with the responsibilities of resistance. You have a responsibility of courage when you become a winner. You have the responsibility of consistency. And that makes quitters of people because they don't want that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Having to do it again and again and again and again and again. But at least what we can take strength of or at least take hold of and understand that each rep that we are hitting over again, over again, <laughs> Though it starts to hurt more, but we know that we're getting stronger, right? With each rep that we're doing, it starts to hurt a little bit more than the previous one, but we know that we're getting stronger. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel good, but we have to trust the process. See, did you notice though, right when they're in the middle of the storm and that they started to focus on Jesus, that the storm didn't just disappear, but they weren't thinking about the storm anymore. It's almost disappeared in their mind. That when they started to focus on Jesus, that they forgot the storm. They took their eyes off the wind and their gaze was completely focused on Jesus. Waves were high, the, 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 the wind was loud, but it didn't matter anymore because Jesus was walking on water. Mm -hmm. It's awesome that the storm didn't cease, but it no longer mattered because somebody bigger entered the room. And see, the challenge of it here is that you know, for us to calm the storms, we have to look into it. It's like, are you in awe of the image of God or are you consumed by the winds? 
Are you in awe of your image of God? And if you tell me that you are focused on God, but still confused, or excuse me, still worried and confused of what's going on, then I just have to question your image of God. Mm. You can't say I'm focused on God, but I'm still worried. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. Unless your image of God is not up to par. See, if you're still wondering if it's all worth it, then you radically underestimate the amazing life that God has for you. See, this life is not going to be storm-free, but it's sure going to be fun. The first way that we have to embrace and how to enjoy our spiritual life is we have to calm the storm. How do we do that? Is we have to focus on God. When we go out to the conference and come back, not all the storms are going to be calm coming back. Right. There's still going to be a lot of things we're going to have to face. Yeah. But the main thing we need to do is when we come back, it's going to have to be focused on God. We're going to get all these different types of advice in the conference. Some might even contradict each other. We don't know what's <laughs> going to happen. You've gotten that advice, right? Yeah. But we have to come back as I'm simply focusing on God. Yeah. See, point number two, once you start focusing on God, you're going to get to learn how to do something in your life. And that is point two, learning to surf. Mm -hmm. See, if you had Jesus' powers for a day, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Think about that. Would you, like, parachute with, uh, excuse me, jump out of a plane without a parachute? You know, would you swim with sharks? Would you just walk on water like Jesus did here? Would you float up like he did at the last day, just like, you know, slowly, I wonder, just disappear into the clouds, scare everybody around you. Uh, you know, it's crazy once you start thinking what Jesus did, but here, looking into the same account, um, but a different account, excuse me, in Matthew 14, verse 25 through 31, the same story in Matthew 14, it says, shortly before John, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. Cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? You know what I like most about the story? It's the fact that the winds didn't die down until Jesus got into the boat, according to Mark chapter 6. Meaning that, I don't know actually logistically how Jesus walks on water, but I assume that the wind was still going when Jesus was walking on the water. So either it happened this way, where Jesus, where he was walking, kind of made a smooth path, that everything was going crazy around him, but he was still calm and collected. But just for fun, I like to think that even he was kind of going up and down the waves and everything. And you think about it, like if Jesus was doing it that way, that would have made Jesus look a lot more terrifying coming towards you on a boat, you know. Now, then we would start thinking, oh, okay, I understand why they're afraid, you know. But, but it's awesome. If you start thinking like Jesus was having his own Spartan race. You know, if he was going up and down those waves, kind of going up and down, sliding down them, I, I can just see Jesus having the most fun in his life going up and down these waves. Where the guys were freaking out in the storm, Jesus was just calm, either calm, cool, or collected, or he was having a blast of a time through it. See, he didn't have fun when the wind ceased. He was doing during it. He was having fun during it. He was calm, collected during it. See... In here, in Proverbs 17, verse 22, it says, A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Mm. I want you guys to take a moment. I want you to write down one bad thing that's going on in your life right now. Or think about it. Think about what's one thing that you feel, I can complain about this. Give you a couple seconds. And I want you now to share good news about your one bad thing. I want you to try to train your mind and think about how can I turn this bad thing into a good thing? Let's take a couple of volunteers. Who has one bad thing that they think that they can turn into some good news? Uh, let's do a different challenge then. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys don't have it, amen. Um, I want you guys to think of how, uh, let's take a volunteer. Who can think of one good news when you don't have visitor on a Friday night? How can you turn that into good news? 
got to hang out with my friends. No, share it as good news. Hey guys, my good news is I got to hang out with my friends on, fri on Friday. That was Pascal and Marari and Sephora. Amen. Amen. <laughs> mm. How can you share good news about if you got a flat tire? Let's get Tyrone. Okay, I've had a flat tire before, so... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I had a flat tire, but then... Um, this brother came over and he helped me buy or share the cost of getting a new tire. Oh, so I'm gonna look that. There we go. That's a great brother. Come on. <laughs> All right, Pascal, share good news that your cousin's in the hospital. <laughs> oh, my good news. Okay. <laughs> my cousin's in the hospital, but all my family members, we got to stop what we're doing just to go and get a visit. Them. There you go. That's the good news. See, see, the thing is, and the truth is, is that with all things in our life, that's how God wants us to react. Yeah. God wants you to enjoy every single day of your life. Sure. Rain or shine, storm or calm, cool and collected. Satan is the only one that wants you to be miserable. We know the end part of this scripture, but we can start off in the beginning in John 10.10. 10. It says the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance. That's the AMP version, meaning have it to full until it overflows. See, there are many ways to kill something and waiting is one of them. Hmm. Meaning you just out, out, outlive them. It's easier to destroy a dream after it's been decayed a bit. See, can your joy outlast the question of when? See, most people wait to be happy or joyful or share good news yeah. when something good happens. When things change. But don't wait until when things get better. You know, go after it no matter what. Mm -hmm. Don't wait until, oh, wait, I'm going to wait until this situation changes and then I'm going to be happy. Yo, this thing is, is, is that we have to go after it in the beginning. People think about that all the time, even now, when they're seeking God with all their heart. Yo, when university's done, I'll do it. When exams are over, I'll go after it. Yo, when the fat lady comes home, or whatever the saying is, whatever it is, right? I don't know if that's the saying. When the fat lady sings. There you yeah, go, when the fat lady sings. sings. Okay. <laughs> she comes home. <laughs> is it like when the cow She goes like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those. So people make up anything for when something's going to happen. But the thing is that God wants you to take hold of your life now. He was giving you life to the full, even when there are storms. Mm -hmm. And we got to learn how to do that. Is that God is not waiting on wind. He wants you to enjoy your life now. See, it says a crushed spirit can dry up the bones. Remember, if you've ever read in Ezekiel 37, how the words of God brought life to the bones? Mm -hmm. Well, a crushed spirit counteracts that measure. Meaning even though the word of God can bring life to your life, life to your bones, your own self can, your own self can start destroying that. Mm -hmm. See, if you have a negative mind or heart, don't blame your situation, your emotions, or anything else. You are in sin. Mm -hmm. And you're right where Satan wants you. Mm -hmm. Right what he wants you thinking about. Even if it comes to the scriptures, you know, it's funny when people start questioning the Bible, what do they say? They say, well, it was just written by men. You can't trust what men say, right? That, that's what they're trying to say. They're trying to downgrade the Bible and just say, it's just men. Why? Because men's thinking and thoughts and everything, it's, it's flawed. It doesn't work. And we agree with that, actually. Yeah. But we, all we just say is, no, the, God, the, the Bible is all written by God. And yet what we do in our life is we still allow the words of men to enter our life. How? By our own thoughts. And we stop living according to the words of God and we start living to the words of men and it starts hurting our own lives. Mm. We allow the words of men to shape our lives more than God and it actually comes from within, not just from other writings. And the thing is when that happens and we, when we notice that these things are happening in our lives, that we want to reach out and we want to go after God but we think of ourselves too low, we have to really wash it first, right? Because if I gave you a cup of water, but I said, hey, there's a little bit of poison in here, you would swipe it away. You wouldn't drink it. Mm -hmm. What would you do first? First, you would have to wash it first, right? 
then why are you trying to fill your hearts with joy without washing your attitudes away first? It doesn't work that way. You gotta wash that away. Wash your heart with the living water and have a full cup. You know, and, and how do you start cleaning a kitchen? It's one dish at a time. It's the same way, how do you start cleaning your heart? It's one thought at a time. Mm -hmm. My challenge to you is write down one of your top complaints. Whatever that is, the top thing that you believe in that you tell yourself. And the simple challenge is never say it again. Treat it as it is, what, which it is, sin. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Satan just trying to get into your life and trying to, to make you doubt and trying to stop you from performing what God wants you to do. See, with this, in, in order to understand the, the important impact of what Jesus was doing, we see here that Jesus was not intentionally going to get involved with the disciples' issues. He was simply racing them to the other side. Jesus learned in his life, even when things were going crazy, his cousin just died, there was waves going on, he wasn't just walking on a cool, calm lake, he was all going crazy. His disciples are still hard-hearted, but yet he was enjoying his life. See, this is the difference between living a life of faith or when you're just straining at the winds of life. See, when you live a life of, of, of faith, then you're just surfing everywhere that you go. Mm -hmm. See, the disciples saw Jesus surfing the waves, and they were terrified, yet one brave soul, Peter, decided that he wanted to be like Jesus. Now, Jesus wanted, uh, excuse me, Peter wanted to experience his life, and he did so for a little moment, but that would have been something he would talk about the campfires for the rest of his life. Mm. They would have said, like, hey, Peter, man, remember when you walked on water? Like, yeah, I did it. But you fell, like, the next two seconds. Don't worry about it. How, did you ever walk on water? <laughs> like, no, okay, okay, you got me there, Peter. See, in the end of it, guys, that the demands and the storms of life are never going to cease. <clears throat> the only thing that you can control is your attitude and how you're going to view it and deal with it. Yeah. See, yes, we're going on a small retreat or a vacation or a way away in our conference. But coming back is when we're really going to have to fight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I encourage everyone to go over there and get the strengthening like Jesus did when he was away. But when Jesus came back, he wasn't wishing, man, I wish I had another couple days right. or another hour. He was coming back and surfing the storms in his life. Yeah. And let's have that same motivation as we go away and we come back next week. Amen.